three, the books destroyed. Something had occurred that same year, a little while before this, away from our town of Caversham, down the River Kennet, down the River Thames, lay London Town, and there at Old Saint Paul's, before the Rood of Northern, as men called the crucifix by the great north door of the cathedral. A large fire was crackling and leaping one Sunday in February 1526. On a platform above the altar steps sat the great cardinal, Thomas Wolsey. Oh, he was a magnificent sight. He wore a purple robe and scarlet gloves. His shoes were golden, and a canopy of cloth of gold was over his head. Abbots and bishops and friars who were gorgeously dressed in satin and damask were around him. And within the altar rails on the platform were baskets that were piled with Lutheran books, which had been seized by Wolsey's orders. The sermon was preached by John Fisher, the old bishop of Rochester, who could not be heard because of the disturbance of the great number of people, for the building was full so full that no more could get in. After the sermon, five men were brought in to kneel down and ask forgiveness of God and the church and the cardinal. And then these men were led three times around the fire before the root of Northern as a warning of what they might expect to suffer if they said or did anything more against the Romish friars. One of the five men was an Augustinian friar himself, and he had been threatened with being burned to death if he did not retract a sermon he had preached. But as at last he had agreed to come publicly and kneel down and ask forgiveness, he was not to be burned. The books that had been taken by Wolsey's men were burned instead, and the cardinal, with the thirty-six abbots, priors, and bishops in splendid array, saw the books burned. And then all these mitred men departed. They had conquered. But had they? Oh, Cardinal Wolsey, you did not know everything. You need not have thought that by burning some books everything would be made quiet in England. If you did think that at all, you were mightily mistaken. For there was coming to poor, downtrodden, priest-ruled England, a book greater than any that Luther or his followers ever wrote. The New Testament was coming, coming to the English tongue. Oh, how Cardinal Wolsey hated that such a thing should come to pass. It was only a few months after this burning that the first of Tyndale's English New Testaments entered England. There were 3,000 printed New Testaments secretly brought into England and the bishops had had letters of warning from the continent about them. But the bishops could not find out who it was that was spreading the books. The bishops did their best, though, to keep the New Testaments away. Through the English ambassador, attempts were made to punish the printer of the Testaments, but nothing could be done beyond seizing 300 copies of the book. The rest of the New Testaments found their way to London in spite of the bishops. No wonder that those English folk who had the New Testaments must be so very careful not to let a single priest know it. Father, I whispered one evening after neighbor Eld's disappearance, do you think that anybody found out that neighbor Eld had a New Testament? I had put my mouth close to my father's ear, for I was afraid to ask such a question aloud. It was yet a secret from my mother that I had ever seen such a book. My father shook his head, as if he could not answer my question. I miss his reading, he returned sadly. I miss it greatly. I wish I knew how you and I could get a New Testament, Editha. So do I, father, I rejoined. It was partly childish sympathy that made me speak so. Still, I often thought of things that I had heard in Neighbor Eld's hut.
and I often remembered the story the old man had read about the traveler from Jerusalem to Jericho who fell among thieves. I especially remembered that story because I had heard neighbor Elt comment on it, and because in my childish mind I contrasted the gospel story with one that my mother had frequently told Stephen and me about a robber and the virgin. The robber got his living by going out on the highways and plundering travelers. It was wicked in him to be a thief, of course, explained my mother when she told us the story. But whenever he went out robbing, he was always careful to pray to the virgin first. At last, this robber was taken and was about to be hanged. But while the rope was around his neck, he prayed as usual, and his prayer was answered, for the virgin herself held him up with her white hands so that he did not die, but lived for two days hanging there. And the man who hanged the robber was astonished and tried to kill him with the sword. But every stroke of the sword was turned away by an unseen hand, and at last the executioner had to let the robber go free for there was no killing him, because the virgin heard his prayer. And after he was free, the robber went to an abbey and became a monk. Was it one of the monks that live here? Asked Stephen, who had listened very attentively to the story. No, no, answered my mother hastily. No, it was no one here. Never think of it, Stephen. None of them were ever robbers. And so this foolish, monkish tale stayed in my mind, and I never saw a new priest without recalling it. I thought, too, of the gospel tale, and of how I had heard neighbor Elda say that the priests would hinder that good Samaritan William Tyndale from bringing the comfort of the gospel to poor English souls that sin had left bleeding by the highway. My mother would have been frightened had she known that I had ever seen or listened to the words of the New Testament. For I had heard her say that it was only a few years before, during the reign of the same king, Henry VIII, that readers of the Bible were compelled to wear the faggot badge on their clothes. I did not know then that William Tyndale he who would translate the New Testament into English had been obliged several years prior to go to Germany in order to make the translation, and that he said of himself, I understand at the last not only that there was not room in my Lord of London's palace to translate the New Testament, but also that there was no place to do it in all England. And now that the New Testament had been translated and printed, what would the bishops do if they could find the books? Ah, those flames by the rood of northern shone yet in the eyes of thinking men. It was those flames that burned the words of the New Testament into my father's heart. Yet, though he believed the truth himself, he could not help my absorbing many foolish notions concerning the saints. I remember that one evening when I was whispering to my father about the New Testament, I suddenly heard Stephen crying in the next room. I slipped away from my father's knee and ran to see what was the matter with my beloved cousin. My tooth aches, sobbed Stephen when I asked him. Oh, I exclaimed sympathetically. I am so sorry. I looked at him and an idea occurred to me. Stephen, said I, when you and I grow big enough, we will go on a pilgrimage to some monastery that has one of the teeth of St. Apollonia. People say that her teeth cure the toothache. And maybe, Stephen, you and I might become rich enough to get one of St. Apollonia's teeth ourselves and keep it always. And then we never could have a toothache any more, could we? We will keep the tooth where we both know where it is, 
so that you can find it in a minute, if I am not home, when your tooth begins to ache. I grew quite enthusiastic over this plan, but to Stephen, suffering from the present toothache, my proposition of future help seemed to bring but little relief. Why doesn't St. Apollonia help me now, if she's ever going to? sobbed Stephen, clasping his aching face. I think she isn't a real good saint if she doesn't help me now, when she knows I am going to a monastery to see her tooth as soon as I am big enough. Oh, oh! And Stephen wept and would not be consoled, while I was quite shocked that Stephen did not speak more respectfully of Saint Apollonia. For I believed in the magical power of that saint's teeth with all my heart. Alas, it was not till years after, during the suppression of the monasteries, that I learned that the teeth of Saint Apollonia, which had been held as sacred relics, had been brought together from the different convents, and it was found that there were so many of these teeth that they filled a ton. So wickedly had the monks deceived the poor English people by pretending that those were saints' teeth, which were not. A <laughs> goodly mouth had Saint Apollonia! I heard a man laughingly say once in those after years, when he heard of the great quantity of teeth that had been collected, had ever a saint such a mouth as she to hold so many teeth? Ah, what a world was England, where men might believe as many such foolish superstitions as possible, and the priests would rejoice and foster such ideas. But let a man once go to the Holy Scripture and read for himself and strive to follow the solemn commands laid down there, and see with what fury the priests would rage. And, if the simple reading of the word was such a sin in the eyes of Rome, what penalty would be sufficient to punish the crimes of those who not only dared to read the New Testament, but in spite of lash or faggot, would have courage to say that the priestly baptism received in infancy was nothing— and would be immersed on profession of their faith in Christ. Should an English person think for himself? Should he have an English New Testament? Should he dare be immersed? Not if Rome could prevent it. She had heard of these Anabaptists before. They had been thorns in her side. Rome had persecuted Anabaptists for centuries on centuries. Woe, woe to any in England who dared be re-baptized. Was it not enough that the sermons of John Huss had been full of anabaptistical errors, that the followers of Huss would admit none to their fellowship until such a person was dipped in water, that many of Huss's followers became anabaptists? Had not Jerome of Prague been baptized by immersion, and were not Huss and Jerome both burned to death long ago? Had not Rome done her best to blot the Anabaptists from the earth? What was this doctrine that it should live and grow during all these centuries since the Apostles' days? The End of Chapter 3